We'll go ahead and open our Bible to Mark chapter 11 as we continue our sermon series looking at the Bible itself, looking at the good book and how good it is for us, what it's all about. And today we're going to be looking at how we can study it, how we can read it. So open a Bible to Mark chapter 11 as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the word of the Lord. We go to our God in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that they would be made still and given peace and comfort by the Holy Spirit through the hearing of God's word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that their hearts may be encouraged and uplifted by the Holy Spirit through God's word this morning. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the message of the Bible, the message of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for sinners. Psalm 19 says, may the words of mouth and meditation, my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So today as we continue our series looking at the Bible and my encouragement to you to be in God's word all the time and to absorb in God's word, today we're going to look at how to study the Bible. Now that's a really big topic and there could be endless amounts of steps and tips and points that I get, give to you, but for the time... For sake of time, we're just going to look at three main ideas that I want you to hold on to as you go into God's Word, as you make it part of your daily life and your daily rhythms. And so we're going to start in Mark chapter 11 and to kind of explore why is this so important for us. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Now, this little story about the fig tree, the following day is the day after Palm Sunday. So this is Monday of Holy Week. And Jesus is going into Jerusalem. He's preparing to die on the cross and to suffer for our sins and then rise from the dead. And so the day after Palm Sunday, he's hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When Jesus came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And after that, you say, praise to you, O Christ. Right? We're, we're just so excited by that Bible passage. Right? No, some of you are honestly actually shaking your heads at me. No, because it's a weird story. Right? You read that and you go, okay. Like, I could read the story of Jesus dying on the cross and I go, what? Amen, like I, I get it, I know what it's about. This looks like Jesus was hungry, he got a little hangry, and he got mad at the fig tree and cursed it. So the moral of the story is that you have permission from Jesus to be a little cranky when you need a snack, right? And I mean, like all of us are hoping that's true because anybody get cranky when you need a little snack, right? But obviously, Jesus is doing something more than that here, and it's deeper than that. But my point is that when we, I tell you, oh, I want you to be in God's word, how many of you have ever come to a story like this one or a passage that confused you, and you didn't get it? And you're like, I, I want to study God's word. I want to be in it, but, but I don't understand it. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, is simple steps of how can I get better at understanding God's word and studying God's word. And so we're going to be looking at various scripture readings. The first is Psalm chapter one, and this is point number one. Go slowly, right? Take your time. You are not going to flip open the Bible tomorrow, read one passage, and have it all figured out and just understand everything that's ever been written in God's word. It takes a long time to grow in our faith, to mature, but we want to stay in it and be in it because we want to be with Jesus. And so Psalm chapter 1 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But verse 2, but his delight is in the law or the instruction, the word of God, the word of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. The word meditate in Hebrew is chaga, and it means chewing your cud, right? So if you've ever seen a cow 
and they're just constantly standing there chewing the cud, and it goes on and on and on and on forever, but they're doing that to absorb as many nutrients as they possibly can. And that's where, that's where the word meditate in scripture comes from. That's the picture, that's the image that, that I don't wanna just rush through the scripture reading, right? I don't wanna just start a daily Bible plan and then I, I read it and I can check it off the list and I can get going as fast as I possibly can just to say I did it or to brag to people, look how far I am. But we wanna actually meditate, sit with God's word and absorb it. So go slowly, this is not a contest. You don't have to read the Bible in a whole year. Right? Now, if you do that, more power too. That's wonderful. You'll be blessed by it, but you don't have to. Here's another thing to kind of set your guilty conscience free. You can miss a day. Just let that sink in for a moment. I am giving you permission. <laughs> I know it says day and night, so you should think about it. But if you do, guess what? There's still grace and mercy and love for you. God's word will still be there. So many people I've met as a pastor start a Bible reading plan, and then they give up because, and the reason they tell me is like, well, I missed a couple of days. I got behind. And so it's just like, well, I might as well just quit. But God's word is encouraging us to go slowly. It's not a contest. It's not a race. It's not just, oh, I, how many books did I read this week? No, it's just, did I meditate? Did I absorb? Did I take time to be in God's word and absorb what he wants to teach me? through it. Another way to think about this is after the resurrection of Jesus, he spends time with his disciples, and he hangs out with them, and he teaches them the scriptures, and he tells them over and over and over again, usually over meals, that he came to fulfill the scriptures, that everything that was written in Moses and the Psalms and the writings and everything we call the Old Testament was about him, and he's done it, he's fulfilled it. Now just think about that for a moment. How awesome would that be to study God's word with Jesus over a meal? How many of you would like that? That'd be really cool. I, I would be interested in that devotion, All right? Now think about it this way. When we rush through scripture, it's like we're at the meal with Jesus and then we're telling them, I've got to go. Can we put this in a to-go box real quick? I've got to leave, right? Now, if you were actually with the disciples and you were there with Jesus having those meals and he's teaching the scriptures, how many of you would just interrupt Jesus midway through the Psalms and be like, you know, this is great and all, but I got things to do. So if you'll excuse me, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pack up the bread and the fish in this to-go bag and, and I got to leave. How many of you would, would leave early? Or would you say, I'm gonna spend some time with Jesus? I think most of us would say, I'm gonna set this table until he kicks me out. <laughs> now here's the thing. I, we, we're not physically with Jesus in that sense like the disciples were. But Peter tells us in one of his letters that those of us who have the scriptures have something more special and powerful than what the disciples had at the Mount of Transfiguration. So when you are in God's word, you are being with Jesus. You are sitting with him in his presence. So my encouragement to you is, is, is don't rush away from that meal. Don't go, oh, I got a lot of stuff that I gotta get to. I got a lot of important things that are on my schedule. So I'll, I'll read one verse, check it off, just so I don't feel guilty and get done with it. No, we wanna actually sit down and spend time with Jesus. Like the psalm says, we want to meditate and absorb God's word, even if it's just a few verses a day, okay? All right, point number two, get some help. Now, that covers a whole lot of areas of your life, okay? But just we're just right now focusing on reading the scriptures because Mark 11, that gospel reading, which we'll get to here in a moment, I know, I can tell from your faces, it was a weird story, didn't make a lot of sense. You're like, okay, well, pastor read it, so there you go. But we, sometimes we need help because what happens? We read scripture and we don't always understand it. It doesn't always make sense to us. Now, one thing I wanna do is encourage you in that to not give up. Because sometimes we don't meditate on God's word. We don't spend time on God's word. 
because we're like, well, I don't understand it, or I don't, I don't get everything that I'm reading. And so the devil comes along and says, well, why don't you just give up then? Or why even bother starting? But here's a word of encouragement from 2 Peter chapter 3, our epistle reading. It says this, our brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. Now just think about this for a moment. You know who wrote 2 Peter? That's not a trick question. Peter. It's in the name. I'm not trying to trick you or mess with you. All right. Peter wrote 2 Peter. You know who Peter was? He was the head of the apostles. He was their main leader, the go-to guy, the leader of the church. He wrote letters of the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of Mark. Peter did a lot of stuff, y'all. And then he read Paul's letters. And you know what he said about Paul's letters? He's like, it's kind of hard to understand Romans. That should encourage you. And you're like, okay, well, even if, even if Peter thought some of what Paul said was hard to understand, then it's okay if I don't understand everything. But we want to get some help so that we can grow in our understanding and our knowledge of the Word of God. This is why going to church and Bible class is so beneficial to us. It helps us grow in our understanding of God's Word. This is why being in a group with another person or a couple of people and reading God's Word together is so important because the more you do it, guess what? The better you get at it. When I first became a Christian in high school, a week later I gave my first sermon. I don't know why they let me do that, but they did. And I was obsessed with reading God's Word. Now, when I first started reading God's Word and every single day, I had no idea what a cross-reference was, right? Now, what they found is that there's about 64,000 cross-references throughout the scriptures. That's a lot, right? But what I did is I got a Bible that had it. I learned a little bit about what they do is they're a tool that helps you go, okay, this passage says this, and it's similar to this passage, or it's referring to this passage, and I can read that, and it grew my understanding of different stories and different Bible books that I hadn't explored yet. So I wanna give you just some practical, here's some helps that you can use in order to grow in your understanding of God's word. The first is picking a translation that you understand. It doesn't do you any good to pick a translation that someone recommended to you that you can't understand the language of. All right, so three that I like and recommend, and there's more that I could recommend, so if you're like, tell me more after service, just I'll, I'll give you more. But three that I like to recommend are the English Standard Version, the ESV, that's what our Pew Bible is, Christian Standard Bible, CSV, and then the NIV, New International Version. Now there's lots of other great versions, and if I didn't list yours off, don't take personal offense to it, I like the old saying that the best version translation that you read, or the best translation is the one you actually read, right? It doesn't do you any good to go buy a bunch of Bibles and all kinds of translations, put them on a bookshelf, and then say, there they are. Look how pretty they are, right? The, the best one is the one you'll actually open and read and understand. But the nice thing about many Bibles is you can get what's called a study Bible, so a study Bible have the text and the scriptures up top and then below and have footnotes that give you commentary and information about what the verses are. You can get a reference Bible to show you, hey, these are all the different passages that are similar to this. And if you really want to go deeper, you can get commentaries. What a commentary is, it's just a study Bible on steroids. It's just, okay, you really want to know about this book of the Bible or this passage. And so a couple, you can look at these after service is the Christ-Centered Exposition Series. Christ-Centered Exposition. I know it's a fancy word. And then this one is called the CPH Blue Commentary Series. You know why it's called the Blue Series? Because they decided to make it blue. And that's the name we came up with for it. But this is published by CPH, our Concordia Publishing House. And these are two commentary series. So if you want to take your Bible studying and your devotion more seriously or more deeply, those are tools that are available to you, but here's the point. Give yourself grace, guys. When you open up the scriptures, you might not understand everything you read. Even Peter said, hey, some of this is hard. 
But you know what helped Peter, no matter whether you're buying Bibles, study Bibles or commentaries or Bible studies, is the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I'm going to send you the helper, the spirit of truth. He's going to lead you into all truth. When Jesus taught the disciples and they were finally starting to understand what the Bible was all about, it's all about him, it took the Holy Spirit opening up their minds and their hearts to see that. And you, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. So here's a prayer that I often pray when I dive into God's word is, Holy Spirit, help me understand the truth. Because Jesus said, I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit, and I believe Jesus, Jesus said the Holy Spirit's gonna teach you the truth. So if you're going into scripture, you're like, I'm not quite sure what this is about or what I'm supposed to get out of this, ask for help. How many of you love asking for help? (laughs) This is one time where you wanna ask for help. Ask the Holy Spirit, will you guide me into the truth of God's word? So point number one, go slowly. Take your time, meditate on God's word. Point number two, get some help, ask the Holy Spirit for help. And then point number three, the most important point, is know what and who the Bible is all about. I'm gonna say this real bluntly. The Bible is not about you, okay? We often read it like it's about us. What can I get out of this? How am I in this story? How has this helped me? The Bible is written for you, but it's not about you. It's written for your benefit, it's written for your blessing and your encouragement and you being able to have salvation in Jesus Christ. But the Bible is about, anyone wanna guess who it's about? Jesus, yeah, y'all been listening, good job. So write that one down. When you enter into your study time and your devotion time, your meditation time, remember, I'm not the hero of the story. My savior Jesus is the hero of the story knowing who it's about. So if you go back to Mark chapter 11, the suspense is killing you, I know. We're gonna go, why did Jesus do what he did? So on the following day when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and seeing the distance of fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. So he cursed it, saying, may no one ever eat fruit from you Again. Now, here's the thing. It says it's not the season for figs, and so everybody goes, well, then what's wrong with Jesus, right? (laughs) If it's not the season of figs, why would you get mad about it? But there's something that grows on fig trees called the pagim, and it is when it buds, and it's before they're in season, before the fruit has fully blossomed, and the pagim is still eaten by people. And so when Jesus sees it, yes, there's not figs, but there's also not the budding happening. It's not producing anything. Now, here's the deal. One of the ways you can read the Bible, kind of understand what's happening, is going, okay, here's a word, fig trees, right, and fig leaves. And we go, when's the first time that word or that picture ever shows up in Scripture? And it helps us understand what's the image, what's the metaphor that Jesus is drawing off of. And way back in Genesis chapters one, two, and three is the first time we ever see fig leaves and fig trees. And so after Adam and Eve sin, they are filled with guilt and shame, and they run to hide away from God. And the scripture tells us that what they did in order to cover their nakedness, cover their shame, in order to hide their sin, so to speak, they took fig leaves and sewed garments out of them and put them on their bodies. But the story also goes on and tells us it didn't work because God still found them. And he asked them, why are you hiding? And they admit it, it's because we're ashamed. We, We took the fruit and we're guilty, we've sinned. And the story ends though with God making the first sacrifice ever in scripture of his own creation. He sacrifices animals and covers them with animal garments and says, I've taken away your shame and your sin. So throughout scripture, throughout the prophets like Hosea and Joel and Isaiah and others, fig leaves became an image for judgment upon sin. But it also became an image of judgment upon sin and and that our, our works weren't enough to cover our own sin. 
Now, the context of this story is that Palm Sunday just happened, right? Everybody with the palm trees and shouting Hosanna, and Jesus is our Savior, and this is wonderful. And in the middle of it, so that he curses the fig tree, and then the next day, he goes down to the temple, and he cleanses the temple. He kicks out the money changers and all the people and all the corruption, and he kicks out everything and overturns everything that was a human tradition that was keeping people from God. So the next day, Peter sees the fig tree, and he goes, Rabbi, look, it, it shriveled up. It's not going to produce life anymore. And Jesus, in verse 22, says this, have faith in God. Now, that's a weird thing to say in response to, hey, the fig tree shriveled up, and Jesus just goes, have faith in God. And you're like, okay, great. I'll have faith. What's that got to do with the tree, though? How many of you want to know what that has to do with the tree? Right? And so here's the deal. The fig tree represented all of the human efforts since Adam and Eve to cover up our own sin, to be our own heroes, to be our own saviors. And Jesus cleanses the temple of all the human traditions that kept people from God. He curses the fig tree and says, I don't want you to produce any fruit anymore because I don't want people to trust in themselves or in the human traditions for salvation. I want people to have faith and trust in God. Makes sense. He's saying, I, I don't want you to trust in yourself. I don't want you to go to the scriptures and view yourself as the own hero, your own savior anymore. I want you to have faith. I want you to have trust in God because I'm here to be the savior, to be the sacrifice that covers all your sins. So when you and I dive into scripture, one of the questions we can ask ourselves is, how does this remind me or show me or tell me the story of Jesus or the story of how God is the hero redeeming his people? And at the end of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, Jesus has an interaction with his disciples and he gathers them together and he says this to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand all the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and die and on the third day rise from the dead. You get the point that Jesus, after his resurrection, looks at his disciples and says, here's what the whole Bible is all about. That the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior must suffer and die and then rise again from the dead. So when we go into God's word, we're, we're spending time with him, we're learning more about Jesus. Ultimately, what he wants us to learn is the message of the gospel, that he came to suffer and die and then rise again. And then at the end of Luke, he says, so that the forgiveness of sins can be proclaimed to the whole world, every single person. See, we wanna learn how to study the Bible so we can learn how to share the Bible. So we can learn how to share the message of Jesus dying and rising again for the forgiveness of sins, not just for ourselves, but for the whole world. All right, so three points one more time. Go slowly. Have that meal with Jesus. Spend some time with him. Number two, get some help. It's okay to use a study Bible. It's okay to ask other people what they think and what they've learned. It's okay to read a commentary to see what the church has taught over the centuries. You don't have to know it all. Just get started. And then number three, know who it's all about. And it's about Jesus and the story of him redeeming you and all sinners through his death and resurrection. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that the story of Scripture is a story all about you. It is a story about how God is taking care of all of our sin and guilt and shame by redeeming us through your death and resurrection. Holy Spirit, may you guide us into all truth as we spend time with Jesus in his word. And may you give us the words and the conversations we need to share the good news of Jesus and his forgiveness with the world around us. In your name we pray. Amen.